Welcome everyone. It's very, very nice to welcome you here to the Center for Women's Studies and Education. I'm Angela Miles. I'm the acting head just now. Jamie Rickman is the coordinator. We and the Canadian Council of Muslim Women have sign-up sheets here for very easily accessible if you'd like to hear our news and our events and uh, connect with both of these organizations. Um, we're very, very, very pleased to welcome everyone here and also the Canadian Council of Muslim Women and Linda, who has done this research uh, in alliance with them. We see ourselves here at the Centre for Women's Studies as a hub of multi-centred feminism, a space that is here for feminists and women to really be in dialogue and deepen our understanding and grow our visions in ways that can really make a much, much better work for world for us all. And in that spirit, it's a real pleasure to welcome your group here. Thank you. And I will, at their personal request, inter, 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 introduce them, taking one second only each. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, um, Professor, Li Professor Linda Clark is Professor at Concordia in Religion and Islam. And she has worked with CCMW on a number of issues. And I did hear a presentation at the AGO of the CCMW and uh, can attest that uh, this is very interesting work. And uh, it'll be nice to have longer to talk about the way you did the research and about mm -hmm. uh, the kind of things you found. Um, Alia Hogben is the Executive Director of the Canadian Council for Muslim Women. You may hear her from time to time on the radio. Mm -hmm. If you listen to the CBC, do the other stations call you? Yes, they do. Okay, well. That's you listen great. to the CBC. Uh, well, I, I just know you're on the CBC. <laughs> yeah. And she is a wonderful voice for feminism and in particular for the challenges that uh, Muslim women are facing. It's always a pleasure to hear you, and I'm really, really interested to have the opportunity to hear about the organization more. So we just can't uh, be more thrilled and looking forward to hearing from you. So uh, without further ado, I think it, who's going to start? Go ahead. Uh, Alia, I'll uh, leave it to you. Thank you, Angela. We want to thank uh, Angela and uh, Jamie, who's the back there, for organizing this. And we're so thrilled to be here because we do want to, to talk about it and to discuss this particular project. And uh, Asma is from CCMW, and so is Nusa Jaffe, a board member. So we're very happy to be here with all of you. Um, I'm just going to do a, a two, three minute introduction and then more time so that Linda can talk and you can also ans ask questions. Uh, we are grateful to, to Linda for taking on the task of writing the report, which is based on an online survey. Can you hear me? Yes. I know I've got a carrying voice. Focus groups and interviews we held with the women. As the project was funded by the Ontario Trillium Foundation, we were limited to Ontario, but were able to hold a focus group in Montreal because excluding Quebec uh, in this discussion would have been problematic for us. CCMW is pleased to have undertaken this groundbreaking research as except for one earlier one in, in France, a small one, this study is the first of its kind. For the last 30 years, CCMW has advocated for Muslim women and girls within the context of the family. We describe ourselves as believing women who are committed to gender equality in all aspects. We base this on our understanding of Islamic principles and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We are part of uh, international networks as well. The one that is very active just now is called Musawa, which means equality. This network of over 40 countries with Islamic scholars and activists is researching ways to create change in the family law while remaining within the framework of Islamic teachings. One of our guiding principles is that as Muslim women, we aim to be actively inclusive and accepting of the diversity among ourselves. We also acknowledge that though we advocate for all Muslim women and girls, there are others amongst us who represent differing perspectives. For example, CCMW, with the help of various Islamic scholars, has positioned papers on various controversial subjects, such as violence against women, polygamy, and the hijab. However, this in no way impedes us from actively supporting those women who believe that the head covering, whether the hijab or the niqab, is required according to Islam. We know that the niqab itself is a complex issue, 
and raises many questions for Muslim communities and the wider community, Canadian society. We sub submitted a brief to the Quebec legislature when they were considering Bill 94 a couple of years ago, which would have denied employment in the public sector, as well as provision of services to individuals who wear the hijab or the niqab. We have again submitted another brief regarding the current proposal by the Quebec government, the Quebec Charter of Values. I think the discussion is going on as we speak, mm -hmm. which we find discriminatory against the Charter, the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We have often been contacted by the media and the public to explain why some women cover their faces. Rather than making assumptions, we decided that these women should be given the opportunity to speak for themselves. It was not an easy task to find women who were willing to discuss their lives and their reasons for wearing the niqab, which is the face covering. The study does not directly address the religious or theological basis of the practice, but rather it is about the lived experiences of the women and the diverse narratives they have shared with us. Our intent is to ensure this research has a wide distribution and is available to the media, the public, policymakers, and politicians. We thank you for today's presentation and for all of you showing an interest by coming. We are very grateful to the women who came forward to speak with us and to share their personal experiences. We thank them for their courage and we hope that they are pleased with the report and its findings, which is on our website. As an aside, we promised the women we interviewed that we would respect their confidentiality so it was up to them to share their contact information or not to share it. We have led those who were kind enough to share their contact information about this session and that have uh, told them also that the report is on the website if they were interested. Thank you. That's all I'm going to talk about. Now I'm going to let um, Professor Linda Clark take over. Thank you, Alia. Um, Alia, you mentioned that the report is on the website. How many people here have had a chance to look at it? Not a lot of people have had a chance to look at that, I guess. Um, uh, so I would encourage you to do that. Uh, the material is there. I, I don't want to summarize it now. I'd rather use most of the time to get some um, questions, feedback, especially critical and other perspectives from you. And I'll just touch on a few things um, here. Um, uh, maybe I can give you a summary of the parts of the report, which is, I guess, somewhat lengthy. It's about 50 pages or so. The parts of the report having to do with interactions and attitudes towards Canadian society on the part of these women, uh, because that has direct policy implications. Um, I'd like to... Uh, then address the issue of my sample, the sampling techniques and so forth, because I think that's going to be a point of controversy here in this, um, in this uh, study. And uh, you've just showed me a piece in the media that questions our yes. sampling. Yes, uh, what, what yeah. we, we, we know, um, I know Linda's going to talk about, we know that the group we got, we got them through listserv, spreading the word around, but it was through the internet. And we did we did a what they call a monkey survey. I don't know if you're all familiar with that. And we got a we did a questionnaire there, and people responded to that. And then we put out more word, and we did focus groups. We did four focus groups, um, in which about between uh, 14 to uh, to 22 women came, women who wore the the niqab and hijab. And we had that discussion. Then we did some individual ones. And but we've just uh, seen uh, the, the Sun Media. Um, has an article in there telling us how terrible it is because we only we're trying to encourage it and we're not encouraging or discouraging no. it we're just accepting that this is how some women dress and we nobody knows why they do it so this is pretty good stuff um uh, I'm going to let it wouldn't Linda. be it wouldn't be time for interventions yet but thanks Mara um and I have to say that uh, um, before I embark on my remarks there mm -hmm. that um when I began the study, I really had no idea what I would find. We do have a few um, women, possibly young ladies, um, in our university, Concordia University, Montreal, who uh, wear what is called in French, la voile intégrale, um, that is the niqab. And um, I hadn't ever met those 
those women. I hadn't ever met anyone who had worn that style, at least not in Canada. And so I had no idea about the motivations and so forth. So I went in with no agenda except that, um, uh, except the reasonable proposition that in order to speak about a subject, you should do research about it. You should find data and simply not just project um, your own assumptions. Um, and um, what I found was in some ways surprising, in some ways not. And uh, you can read about it in the report. Um, so, um, in short, after speaking about the sample, I will talk about how I hope the data that we have gathered together, because I worked hand in hand with the Canadian Council of Muslim Women, uh, will be used, or rather, how I hope it will not be used. Because when you put a study out there, then um, it's not your child anymore, and uh, you know, different people can use it for different things or, or look at it in different ways. So um, first, a summary of um, what I found about interactions um, uh, uh, with, uh, of these women with Canadian so society and their attitudes towards Canadian society. Um, and uh, here I found a two-sided story. Um, one is that relations between women wearing niqab and society, at least in Ontario, because this is really where our focus was, are really going fairly well from both sides. I found some good news here. And, uh, and then I sort of saw a dark side too. So I'll start with the positive. Um, first of all, these women were willing to make accommodations, and they emphasized that very much. We usually talk about accommodations from the other side, but um, all of my informants, without exception, really wanted to emphasize that they were willing to lift their veil for purposes of identification and um, so forth, and that they understood that there could be issues relating um, to security, and they were willing to address um, those things. I did not see a sense of entitlement um, from anyone, interestingly. Possibly people are entitled, but this was not their mentality at all. Uh, reports about treatment in medical situations, that is interactions in with uh, doctors and clinics, government offices and public schools were actually quite good, or the assessment of the woman was quite positive. Um, the majority related uh, favorable or even very favorable experiences. And again, I think that the emotional tone is important. There was a sense of appreciation or even gratitude um, for this good treatment as if the woman had anticipated or even, neg or even reasonably expected um, negative uh, reactions. And uh, one story sticks in my mind, although I did not use it in the report. A woman in, Ontar a woman in Ontario went to get her driver's license, and the personnel there um, took her aside to another room so that she could be identified and you know, respected her privacy in, very, in various ways. And she was so surprised and she was so pleased that she went out and got some flowers and brought them to the office. Uh -huh. And uh, that's a little bit over the top, but um, it's indicative of what I would call the emotional tone of my informants, which is, um, I, I think, quite important. Um, above all, our informants were positive and optimistic about Canada. Um, although somewhat less so about Quebec, and um, I, I had to say that in the report, unfortunately. And uh, they were very positive about Canadian, um, Canadian people. And here we have to remember that the sample itself consisted mostly of women who were Canadian citizens, uh, because our finding was that most people who took up the niqab um, uh, they were foreign-born but Canadian citizens and had taken on this practice um, in Canada. That at least was uh, the way it was in our sample. Um, so I find, um, as I commented in the study, um, uh, this strong optimism and uh, patriotism really to be somewhat aspirational. This is the way I would analyze it. I think it reflects to a degree how the woman would like to think of Canadians or how they would like relations between them and the Canadian population to go. That is, 
Um, I think there is a bit of an observer effect here. Uh, the women were happy, genuinely happy with Canada and really wanted to fit in. I think probably they had more negative experiences than they related, uh, but they, want, they understood that they were speaking through us um, to Canadian society and so they wanted to portray how they wanted um, um, things to go. Um, and in fact, in one of the later focus groups, it was made explicit that this material would be heard by Canadians, Canadian society, because I had the interviewers ask, I instructed them to ask um, our informants, who were always busy people, by the way, and very kind and generous to give their time. I asked, they were asked what they expected or wanted from the study. Um, and replies to that question emphasized a need for education. They wanted to people to be educated. They wanted people to know who they are. Um, they mentioned understanding. That was a word that was often um, mentioned, as well as respect. Um, and um, they also hoped that the message would go to the government. They expected the government to do something or to you know, at least not take negative measures. So the message overall uh, was that the woman had not been coerced into wearing the face veil, that they were essentially the same as other citizens, and that they loved Canada. Again, that <coughs> word love was used a few times, also once in relation to Quebec, um, I have to say. And a strong feature of all the discourse was Canadian um, patriotism. Um, one woman um, said, and she is re uh, her words are reproduced in the study, um, after God, the thing that I credit most for my life and my success is Canada, which is a very, very strong statement. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I would describe the subjects overall as integrationist, wanting to integrate into Canadian society. And that's a characteristic I've found to be typical of Canadian Muslims in general. Um, what this indicates to me is that the wearing of niqab should not be taken as a sign of religio-cultural isolationism. It doesn't really seem to be meant that way. I mean, um, uh, styles of clothing uh, of religious clothing can sometimes be a marker of distinction or separation. It can sometimes function that way. We can think of communities or situations where it does function that way. But apparently that's not the intent uh, of these um, women wearing niqab, the ones at least interviewed in our sample. Um, although it's generally taken that way by the public, I think. So that's the positive side. Um, concerning interactions with Canadians and Canadian society. On the other hand, there are some problems, problems that are acknowledged. Um, I cite or refer to um, a 2010 poll, you can read about it in the report, uh, which um, um, shows that 80% of Canadians all across the country, not just in Quebec, um, would have been in favor of the provisions of Quebec's proposed Bill 94. This was the one aimed particularly at niqab and um, proposed that um, women covering their faces be denied public services. That bill uh, seems to have gone dormant in the Quebec legislature, um, but it seems it would have been very popular countrywide. So there is set of underlying attitudes, even if those aren't always openly expressed, um, um, apparently. Um, but sometimes they are expressed. Um, the women did relate instances of abuse, name calling, shouting out from cars, um, you are stupid, don't you know this is Canada. Um, that last one would be quite uh, typical. And also physical assault. Um, assault which would be actionable and in a couple of cases um, things that were really dangerous and I think that's an important reason for putting out this report no matter who these women were are and we had no idea at the beginning really what we would find they do not deserve to be 
the, um, the target of violence. Um, also on the negative side, I would have to list um, some government actions. Um, not only the Quebec Bills 94 and currently 60, but this particular action of the federal government. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but since December 2011, uh, face covering is banned during immigration ceremonies when you take the uh, citizenship ceremonies. Um, some of you apparently know about that. And actually, if you look on the citizenship site, the following phrase appears in bold type, in bold type, mind you, um, which seems to me to be particularly insulting as if the sentence is addressed to non-compliant or non-intelligent people who really have to be told this very strongly. And it reads, again in bold type, all citizenship candidates are required to show their faces when they take the oath of citizenship to demonstrate that they are speaking aloud the words of the oath. Well, um, I do not comment on this on, in the book. I rather let the data speak for itself. But here between ourselves, I think, you know, I would like to comment. First of all, this is obviously illogical because even if people's faces are uncovered, you really cannot tell if they're speaking the oath or not or if they're saying something else entirely. And um, um, I actually know one person who comes from a country originally where that, that suffered um, um, British imperialism and when it came, he said that when it came to the time to swear allegiance to the Queen, he said it but he took one foot a little bit off the ground because he figured that would make it, you know, not valid or something. So I don't know. So, so people could do all kinds of things. I mean, it, it really has no logic to it. Um, it does imply that such women do not like Canada. I mean, it's a projection that they're dishonest, that they're sneaky. And um, if you further research, as I did, um, the statements of the then Minister of Citizenship, Jason Kenney, on this matter, and he is the one who apparently instituted this measure or was key in doing so, um, you will see that he slips in a way and says, well, you know, this practice is um, a practice of a patriarchal society that doesn't value women and treats them like chattel, I think he says, or something, or something like that, which is really a characterization of Islam overall, I suppose. Um, uh, I have heard uh, the minister speak, and he really seems like a good person and a person who could understand religious positions, and it could be that if he reads this report, he would have a different view. Um, you know, because when you meet people personally, sometimes it changes your heart. It's possible. In any case, government actions of this sort and um, grandstanding by politicians on these very few women who wear this, who wear the niqab, and there are probably very few together. Um, can be very helpful, can be very unhelpful. Um, um, for grandstanding, I might mention what happened um, uh, with politicians from several parties at both the provincial and federal uh, levels during the 2002 Quebec elections controversy. You might not have heard about that one um, when there was a fear um, on some parts of, uh, from some parts of the population that women wearing veils might come to vote, which in fact they're entitled to do. But um, anyway, there was, there was um, a great deal of, uh, of grandstanding on that. And if you look it up on the web, you will see some politicians um, and parties that you would not think would do this, but they did it. Um, and I think that that motivated us in the study also. These, these women, as few as they are, um, really have very few friends. And um, um, we don't like to throw women overboard as, as women in this organization. Anyway, actions like this have the potential of legitimating negative attitudes and actions and even assault. Um, so what we have in the result is a situation of the women we spoke to appealing to what they admire and espouse as Canadian values. They often talked about Canadian values, such as multiculturalism, rights, 
and freedom, while some governments or government fig figures understand that much more restrictively. Now my second part about the sample. You have already spoken about how we obtained the sample. Um, it's not possible to randomize a sample very much or completely at least, um, um, especially in a, uh, a qualitative study. Um, and you will see that in the last part of the report, I go quite um, deep into the possible limitations of the, of the study. And we made some very, I, I think, um, um, good efforts to overcome that. Um, uh, to try to engage, we kept on turning up um, Indo-Pakistani types, so we tried to engage the Arab community, we tried to provide babysitting, we, we um, uh, offered to go out to women's homes to interview them. We are aware of the limitations, we tried to overcome the limitations. Nevertheless, any sample is limited. This is obvious and any piece of research is a beginning to be followed by other research. That is um, obvious. Um, I conclude, nevertheless, in the study that the sample is representative, here I'm quoting, of at least a large segment and probably the majority of women in Canada wearing niqab, probably, or at least a large segment. And I think that's that's a fair conclusion. It could be modified by further research, but at this point it's a fair conclusion. Um, I should also say when speaking of the sample that this sample is from Canada. We're not speaking about um, styles of Muslim clothing or face covering worldwide. Context is important. People think and act differently and have different motivations and live different lives according to context. Um, the um, media piece you showed me seems to show some women I don't know from Saudi Arabia or where. Saudi Arabia is different from here. We are, we are here and we are addressing the context here. We are not making a sociological, let alone an ideological statement about the whole world. That's not our um, purpose. Now, um, that I say that our sample represents probably at least a large segment of, of the women, probably a majority, does not mean that there are not other types or profiles. We are not claiming that, or I am not claiming that. In fact, um, since the report has come out, we've talked to some people, and they, they have told us there are some other types. And that does not disturb us, because our um, goal is not to find one type. Our goal is to find is to find data to help people to build knowledge, which CCMW does, so that we can help women and, um, and, um, and society in general. Um, our informants were not coerced or reluctant to wear the niqab, and indeed all took up the niqab in a spirit of autonomy, typically against the wishes of their family and typically against the wishes of local religious authorities, too. Nor did they seem to be inspired by any religious authority. It seemed to be a very individualistic, autonomous movement to a degree that I found very surprising. Now, this does not mean that there are no women at all, whether a group somewhere or occasional individuals who do not suffer pressure. We looked for those. We did not find them. I looked in literature to try to find <coughs> some. I found one account in French which is purported to be, I say purported because the rescue from Islam genre is very popular in France, but I don't know, it's probably uh, um, believable. Um, it it uh, purports to be a as told by story of a woman who was coerced into naqab and so forth. It's, it's, it's possible. It can't be ruled out not in light of Islam or the meaning of this clothing or the meaning of hijab, but in light of women's experience in general. <laughs> because we know that women of all classes, situations, wearing all styles of clothing, whether very revealing styles of clothing or hijab, um, can be vulnerable to pressure and abuse. We just know that as a sociological, as a woman's fact. 
So we don't rule this out. We are not claiming to rule that out um, because we know, you know, the feminine condition. Um, now, on the other hand, um, as I say in the report, and again I quote, it is better to base discussion and policy on what is known rather than on assumptions and projections. And we saw in the media piece today that, um, you know, the author, um, no matter what we say, no matter how much research we do, how many interviews we do, um, how many statistics we produce, we didn't produce many, but it's certainly a very good start, still things are as people say they are without research. And, you know, as a social scientist, um, I object to that. It's, it's equally wrong or more so to insist on an image and condition for which there is no evidence. You have to have evidence. Um, the evidence will not be blanket evidence. It won't be perfect, but you have to begin from evidence. Now, the third part. Um, the third issue that I wanted to, to address is the use of data. Um, how do I hope, or as it turns out, hope the, the, the um, data will not be used? Um, now, we know that what women wear is crucial since women's bodies are used to display values. That's why we're all gathered here today. If it were, um, if it were a matter of men's dress, I don't suppose we would have such a big, uh, such a big attendance. Women's dress is very crucial. Now, I hope that this study will help to remove the burden of representing values or whatever people project on people um, from niqab wearing women by representing them as individuals with their own ideas and motivations. I hope also that the data will not be used to reify Muslim identity, um, which was evidently not the intent of the women. In other words, I hope it will not be taken up as part of some kind of cause. Here I'm a little bit vague because I've just seen the beginnings of that in reaction to this report. So don't want to jump too far ahead of what is happening. I don't want it to be used in a kind of a project of resentment that would portray the woman as oppressed by Canadian society and demonize people who don't understand or object to their practice because that's not how they felt. They did not feel angry. They did not feel oppressed. They did not feel resentful against Canadian society. Um, they did not see themselves definitely that way at all. And um, there is a wisdom in people who are in the situation and who have to deal with the situation. The way that they wanted to deal with it really was by reaching out to themselves, trying to understand. One of the women says, well, you know, when people come to me and they are negative, uh, or I see that they are afraid of me, she realizes that people are afraid. I like to go to them and talk to them a bit and make them feel comfortable. Um, so that's a particular spirit. Um, I think it's, it is admirable, but it's also practical. And thus in some, I hope that um, um, the material doesn't get taken up into some kind of cause and it remains instead um, about individuals and their rights and their security and dignity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and we do have a good time for discussion and questions and responses. So um, it would be nice if we were in a circle and you could all see each other, but uh, <laughs> not to be. Uh, do sort of identify yourself when you when you speak, and if you wouldn't mind standing, it would really help people hear. I think I don't know if you've noticed there's subways underneath here; they rumble <laughs> through. If people speak <laughs> softly, uh, it can sometimes be difficult. So. Would you like to comment, or do you have any few, any, any more few things you'd like to say? Well, just, just, just again, we that we, we, you know, for people are going to some of, some people are going to criticize us by saying, oh, you didn't really get the whole spectrum of people, and we, we're here. And I'm not from Toronto, but I know there are groups where a lot of uh, Muslim immigrants have settled, 
And I understand that if you wander through there, uh, some areas that a lot of women are wearing the, the niqab and, and, and the hijab, but we were concentrating on the niqab, and that we weren't able to reach them. And we always say, we, we, as, as uh, Linda has said, we're going to try and see if we can reach them. But it was very difficult to mm -hmm. get into the, maybe lack of, we say maybe it was a lack of language, Maybe it's uh, maybe there is some coercion or pressure there we don't know, but maybe there are newer immigrants. Those are things we don't know, but we don't want to make assumptions about that. Mm -hmm. That's about all I think that I would. Uh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask you: Was there a report today in the Sun newspaper? Do you? Is do you? That, it do you was on say, Thursday. Just say a little bit oh, about yourself. Oh, my name is Mara Herskovich. I'm not a student here. I'm actually a volunteer <laughs> at the Canadian Center for Victims of Torture. Mm. I've been for 25 years, I'm sure some of you know it. And I'm just very interested in this subject. Obviously, where I volunteer, we have people from all over the world, many, many women from uh, the Middle East, et cetera. Yes, so did this sign? It, uh, the start, it was in uh, the Thursday, January the 30th paper. Oh, okay. But they, we, we, we did write to them. And they shortened the letter, took out all the nice parts of my letter. <laughs> but they did publish it today. Oh, they did? Okay. Yeah. And did, has yes. Michael Corrin asked you to be on his show? Oh, I, I'm not sure what we do about that. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on with Michael Corrin many years oh, ago. Yeah. Okay. He's yeah. not about this. Mm -hmm. he, he, you know, I don't know if it's worth, worth talking to him. But anyway, <laughs> no, he hasn't contacted us this time. I'm Dorothy Golden Rosenberg, and I'm upstairs here. Um, <coughs> I teach about environmental and ecosystem health uh, in La Haye, our new kind of joint department. Um, I'm from Montreal, so I relate to all mm -hmm. the stuff that's been going on there. Um, and it's, of course, it's so much, that law is so much bigger than just this or this or this. It expands to so many different facets of society in, in Quebec. There's a lot of opposition, and but there are also women marching in the streets for it, which is to me like, you know, what, what I know where it's coming from. It's coming from resentment for the Catholic Church and all the years of oppression. I, I think that that's where that is coming from, and I'm certainly very aware of it. Um, what was the gist of your letter? What was the gist of the article that you're talking about that was in the papers? Because I didn't. See well, it's a um, it's a lady we know rather well. She she's uh, her name is Farzana Hassan, and she um, says we 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 did a bad job of it, and that uh, it's women who are not engaged in dynamic. I mean, it just goes on and on. It's quite a. Um, Quite negative about the study. Mm -hmm. Is she with an organization, or was she speaking? No, she's she's she's, she's an individual. She's still not. She's not with the split of the Congress. No, that's all gone. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So yeah. <coughs> that was just her own personal letter that was criticizing your study that right. she had read or she was familiar with, or she calls. You know, she says these are women who have isolated themselves by donning mobile curtains, uh -huh. and. Uh, you know, and, and she's, she, and she it just goes, she, she's it's just very negative. So I'm just wondering how your letter responded to that. Well, I wrote and a very nice one, and they cut it down. I'm just thinking, I don't know, Angela, if you would. Uh, I did, resp it's, so it's in the big, well, all I'm saying is that I, what I said was. Okay, it's very short, so I, it's uh, 200 words. So you're reading us the full version, the unexpected version. The unexpected. Okay. Um, this is in response to the column by Farzana Hassan uh, about the research on Muslim women wearing the niqab. Uh, we embarked on this research because as a women's organization, we want to provide these women the opportunity to speak for themselves. We have a clear position that the niqab is not required by Islam, but that we will defend the right of a woman to express her religiosity as she so desires. We openly state that this research has some limitations. I think Linda has said so. For example, we were unable to interview those women who may lack facility in English or in the use of the internet. We don't want to make any assumptions, and we don't know what this group could have said. Yeah. What is remarkable about the research is that about 100 uh, Canadian women spoke out. We should heed their individual life stories and experiences and respect them for coming forward. Our hope is that we have done some work towards eradicating stereotyping and racism against these women. The results may disappoint individuals such as Ms. Hassan, who already has a strong aversion not only to the piece of clothing, but to the women who wear it. CCMW is neither encouraging nor rejecting women who dress differently from some of us. Her sweeping condemnations demonstrate her own prejudices and does not reflect 
the 30 years of our work for equality, justice, and empowerment of Canadian Muslim women. Awesome. So, thank you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so angry. I, I should say that we did provide Urdu and Arabic translation on occasion, and yeah. so, you know, we tried for that also. I'm interested to know what bit got cut and what it sounded like. It probably sounded... But he, they took out this quite small. Yeah, no. <laughs> the, the, the word disdain. Um, I have to tell you, I was embarrassed to see my letter in the Sun Media. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, we'll forgive you this time. Well, I quickly, I read it on the subway and I left the paper. I didn't want to be seen with holding the paper. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, hi, my name is Chanel Grinaway. I'm with the Canadian Women's Foundation. Um, I haven't read the full report yet, but I will do so, and I thank you for your high-level um, overview. Are there recommendations um, around um, policy or public awareness? Because I think that piece is really important, and I think, again, you have the data that could support mm -hmm. the need for, um, you know, maybe um, other policy things that you might My yeah. My role explicitly was, was to produce as a social scientist and... and uh, uh, someone experienced in the study of religion and Islam in particular, um, the report, and then I left it to the organization to do the policy recommendations because they have the decades of experience in the field that I don't have. So I have my professional side, they have their professional side, um, and so I explicitly left that for them. Okay. I suggested today possibly that the citizenship thing should be reversed, but in the report I don't even say that, although one might one might conclude it. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for the presentation. I'm in an awkward spot, but that's okay <laughs> for this presentation. Um, my name is Aisha Valiani. I'm a master's student at the Department for the Study of Religion and I have supervision at the Faculty of Law. Um, and I'm actually looking at the recent NS Supreme Court case, which was supposed to decide oh, yeah. whether or not turn this on to wear the niqab in Canadian courtrooms. Yes. Um, so I was wondering if at all was any of the women you spoke with, they had anything to say about the law and how that impacts their lived experiences, so either with the citizenship oath or should they ever need to enter a courtroom and, as it stands, have to remove the niqab? Um, here I should clarify our interview technique, mm -hmm. and it's, it's the um, um, uh, favored or standard um, interview mm -hmm. technique, um, which is that you let your subjects, unless you have a very specific agenda or, or the study is more quantitative, you let the, um, uh, the subjects speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that way you are not eliciting mm -hmm. from them what you want, but what is on their worldview and also what is on their horizon. The laws were not very much on their horizon mm -hmm. at all. Um, even in the Quebec group, they did not mention Bill 94 very much. They just mentioned their hope that the government would not ban the niqab because then they would have to migrate, I'm guessing, outside of Quebec. Um, they were unaware of, of some proposed restrictions on the driving license, although those in the end weren't instituted. Uh, all of the women lived in a very sort of personal world rather than political world. They're very apolitical, all of them, I would say. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Your hand was up for a while. Yeah. Sure. I'm uh, Rebecca Starkman. I'm a PhD student here at Noisy, um, and I study uh, religious experience of girls in public schooling. So I'm very interested in this. Um, my question is, is actually about uh, the interviewers. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that uh, there were interviewers working on the study. Mm -hmm. um, who were they? How were there any sort of criteria or decisions around their own practice or? Um, I um, I I thought that the uh, I I had two MA students who were who were um, assistants. And they were um, young Muslim women who wore hijab, who happened to be students in our department. And then I thought people might be more comfortable with them. But actually, um, those weren't the people that did the majority of work. Because I live in Quebec. It was done in Ontario. So I, had, I relied on the membership of the CCMW, um, different chapters. And I would ask them to do this and that. Um, uh, there are very few, I think, community organizations that one can collaborate with because usually they would have agendas or they would not have the personnel. So here's an organization that doesn't have 
an agenda, just principles, and has the personnel um, who can definitely, and, and more than definitely, understand the instructions and carry them out and send me back the recordings and so forth. I listened to all the recordings and the transcriptions, you know, came out to over 150 pages. And out of all of that, I think there was only one short section that I thought had been contaminated that I couldn't use, that I thought the interviewer was trying to get something out of the person, you know, rather than, you know, standing back as they should. So in short, I collaborated with the organization, which could be a model for other people working with communities, but I don't know if you'd find many organizations like the CCMW, I have to say, admiringly. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Yasmin Mohammed. I'm from the Federation of Muslim Women. Mm -hmm. I just actually want to follow up from the question this young lady had asked. Mm -hmm. um, so you had mentioned that they were willing to accommodate and that's really, really important mm -hmm. information for mm -hmm. the public to know. Yes. So I'd like to know from you, um, and I know that your questions were perhaps in generality, uh, in what context? I mean, it, it, she specifically spoke in the context of court experience, uh, appearances, but in what contexts were these women in Nikab willing to accommodate? Um, this is laid out in detail in the study, so that okay. would be um, um, airport, bank, um, 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 uh, removing for medical examinations to different degrees, um, security, security in general. They were very aware of that. Um, so th there would there would be a range of a, a range of situations. Um, they were generally reluctant to um, lift their veils if there were men present. They would rather have a woman present. Although one of them. Um, said that, well, you know, if there's not a woman present, quote, I remember this quotation, really you can't ask too much, so you have to take what you can get. It's interesting that the women in the somewhat parallel French study um, were not disturbed by men verifying their identity, but these women seem to really want other women to verify <coughs> their identity. So again, it's a, it's a range of situations. Um, a couple of women did discuss the famous court case, and they had different opinions. One thought that uh, that the woman should reveal her pla her her face in the in the in the court, and one didn't thought you, that she you should not. What the court case was, just oh, in yes. case everybody doesn't know. I, I, it's a well-known Ontario court case, but there are ones parallel in, um, now others parallel in Canada, but there are also, and one recently in Britain, and, and a few in, um, in uh, America. Uh, there's quite an extensive literature on this now, and I believe Professor Bach of the University of Ottawa works on it, Ottawa U. Um, so there was a woman who had suffered sexual abuse and she was wearing the cob and the question was would she have to unveil in court to testify if that made her uncomfortable, especially if the people she was accusing were accusing her around or something. And the, and the couple of women who mentioned this actually had different opinions on that. But, but they were, they, I, I think more than the specific instances of accommodation, it's important that they were really wanted to tell really Canada, not us, you know, mm -hmm. but through us, Canada, that they really wanted to be flexible and, and that their religion is flexible and Islam is flexible and so forth. Yeah. My name is Peter Foreman. I'm a uh, scholar, of, with my assistant scholar. <laughs> See, it's a long scholar. association with, with the uh, center. Yeah, an association. Certainly a, a long time with the uh, Center for Women's Studies. Thank you for your wonderful, groundbreaking presentation. Really wonderful. And I'm asking a question which is somewhat uh, related to what you're saying directly, but I think it has a more abstract concept. You said the women were not political, that they were apolitical. Yeah, so I'm just so. wondering, did the notion of solidarity with other women who wore the niqab under oppressive conditions, who were not as free as they are to make a choice mm -hmm. in Canada? In other words, they see themselves as mostly voluntary wearers of the niqab. Entirely, What yeah. about uh, the, the sense of solidarity with people across the, women across the world who are wearing it under different circumstances. No, they, d they did not mention that. So there's One, no connection yeah. of sisterhood or some no. relationship to women uh, across the world who were not as now, fortunate as they are now, to now be we did not we did not pose this question. No, it no. wasn't part of our method. But no, it, it, didn't, it didn't come up. 
I would guess that they are aware of that. Maybe they don't think it's relevant to their situation or whatever. But no, it did not come up at all. But we can, you can see that the, this, I mean, this uh, has been done. But there, some of you, you know, the questions you're raising, it would be fascinating to continue with it. Yeah. And but but yeah. really yeah. with this one, yes. it it was to get them to just come forward and speak. So there's some there's one person here who's been waiting. Go ahead. Oh, okay, I'm Renika Sachitan, and I'm sorry I missed most of your talk. A um, couple of questions or some thoughts that came to mind. The those who you could not reach, and the in the sort of what, what you labeled new immigrant communities. I mean, the very fact that they are wearing, you know, is a pol is potentially or arguably a political or a spiritual act, and. You know, with the you know this theory about you know are they being forced into this or not? I think it's a bit of a red herring. But I wish, however, that better effort was made to bridge that divide, which is a systemic issue that spreads across a lot of access to justice and information. So I'm kind of very saddened that uh, the report doesn't do that. So, and I think it might be seen as a flaw. With, with the greatest of respect to the hard work and wonderful work you've done. The other issue is actually something that's been really bugging me. The other day, um, by the way, I'm, I don't know if I introduced myself. I'm Renuka Sachitanandan. I'm a family lawyer in the city. I've been practicing for about 15 years, doing mostly legal aid. And right now, under the gun because they're cutting our funding, <laughs> uh, which, which is another issue. But I'm not getting into that. So the other point that I want to make is that uh, the other day I heard that a woman died in on an escalator in Montreal, yes. uh, and I, you know, I, and, and of course, you know, my, 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 the image that came to my mind was, a, you know, a young woman in Hale who was 35 or something, mm -hmm. you know, who was just going to work, uh, but yes. I did not realize later until this piece uh, came out on the, on, on Facebook, yeah. uh, as a, a report in the Star, that it was a woman who was wearing oh, Islamic nice. dress. And, uh, and there was a lot of uh, really racist, hard, you know, one less excuse for my, I'm not Muslim, but I, it hurts me and it hurts everybody, it hurts all society, you know, one less uh, terrorist. Like, you know, it's, it's hard being Muslim and I, I sympathize with that, it drives me nuts. But I wonder if you knew about this and I wonder, and there was a huge silence in the media the media was, uh, was afraid to even mention from the little, I read the paper every day, from the little I saw that, you know, this woman was wearing Islamic uh, clothing and it got entangled in the escalator. So, you know, I, I was also considering this is, this is highly troublesome because the media's responsibility to portray, to put the truth out there in a way that is respectful of the community and our values Instead, it appears, I may be wrong, tell me I'm wrong, everybody kept silent until I came across this piece the other day. So um, uh, you would rather that we had asked them about their political views? Is, is, I, I didn't get that. Is this what you are saying? No, the what first I said part? was the, the absence of the women, of your, inabil of your inability for whatever reason to interview the women in the new immigrant communities and uh -huh. because of their, you presume they were language issues. Like for instance, um, there are areas in the city that well, are... Well, that's not necessarily the case. I mean, no, I'm we not did, saying yeah. that, but I'm just saying it, it is a, um, it was just a, an opinion that I expressed that the very fact that they bear is, is, is either political or spiritual and that buttresses you know your view that you know nobody is nobody is forcing anybody. It is reality, it could and, be. It, and and can you know Canadian society has to embrace it, embrace that reality, and act accordingly rather than you know waiting for a woman in in in, in Islamic. I don't know if it's hijab or niqab who gets tangled, you know, tangled yes, and right. dies on a on an escalator. You know, we, you know, it brings you to the policy issue. You know, we have policies for women in the club to go up escalators. You know, like it was just so okay. connected. But I wasn't criticizing. Rest of, oh no, I, 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 I welcome that. Yeah. Okay, so those are those are you interesting this, points. Uh, no, I don't know. I'm not I'm not for for formulating policies for women wearing niqab on elevators. Was it like a that. niqab or was it a hijab? <laughs> Whatever. No, we don't know. Or for oh, anybody. Maybe Nusa knows. They said scarf. Do you know about it, Nusa? 
So I did read that article in the Star uh -huh. uh, about this woman on the escalator who uh -huh. died. From my reading of it, it, it appeared to be in a hijab. I have no mm -hmm. idea what she was wearing, that it got caught and you know killed her. I have no idea what, how that happened. But what was interesting in the article was the vitriol and the Quebec government's justification you know, for their law. See what happens when these women wear this. So uh, that was very unfortunate. And maybe, uh, unfortunately, Shaheen, our board member who lives in Montreal, uh, is away. Mm -hmm. So we didn't hear about it. Yeah. Um, but I think, uh, just to, to your point about the, the sample, we were very concerned about the fact that we weren't reaching the women that may wear it for different reasons. We don't know, we do not want to make assumptions. I still feel very strongly that we cannot, we cannot, you know, guess why uh, those women that we did not reach wear it. Um, in the study, what was very interesting was that, yes, they did say that they wear it for spiritual or religious reasons. They did not say that it was a, an identity marker or a, a political marker. Yes. In it fact, one uh, explicitly denied that it had anything to do with politics. Yeah. So yeah. I thought it was very interesting that, uh, but the other thing I want to say about the methodology was that there was a survey, and the survey really tried to elicit their lived experiences, um, you know, how they interact with Canadian society on a daily basis. So uh, I think you get a very good sense of their interactions and how they feel about that interaction. Um, so we didn't get into, um, you know, uh, the politics of it and the experiences of women around the world because the context was Ontario, the context was Canadian, as mm -hmm. Linda said. Um, and again, we, we did that very purposely because <coughs> a lot of things happen around the world. And if we were to take up every single cause that happens around the world against women, whether it's in Muslim communities or other communities, that's all we would be doing. Our focus is women, including <coughs> Muslim women. And that's why we restricted our, our, restricted our, our study to that. But that does not mean that we don't have views about oppressive regimes that do institute uh, dress codes on women uh, around the world, and our own society, which also imposes dress codes on women. So uh, I think we, we just, I wanted to say that to clarify um, the, the sphere and the context of the study mm -hmm. uh, and our attempts to reach women that are not covered in the study. Um, it was very difficult for many different reasons. Yeah. It was there, there was a gentleman in the back. Yes, please. My name is Mustafa Jabal. Uh, I guess I am the I'm the oldest person here. I'm 79. No, no, no. He's pretty old. I'm, I'm uh, a retired accountant from Manitoba. When I was, I left uh, my home country, that's India, more than 60 years ago. And uh, my mother and all the people, and 100%, all the Muslims, they all wear this. When I got up, they call it burqa, completely. Well, that was the way of that doing. Nobody ever thought about it. But quite lately, a few years ago, I was doing some research, and I, 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 I want to share with you what I read about it. I can't say whether it is authentic or not. It says that in this niqab, or they call it burqa, covering, mm -hmm. it started long before the Holy Prophet Muhammad before that. And they were warring tribes. They used to come and invade. And what the custom was that those warring tribes, those who were winners, they used to take away all the women who were childbearing age and leave all the young and the old. So what the people did that time, in order to slow down the process, they put this niqab covering head to everything completely. So those warriors and all, they will have that it will be that time to pick, you know, who are the child bearing age women or not, you know. So it's, it's went on and went on that was the practice. In the time of the Holy Prophet, women used to go in the wars I was like a nurse, nurses, you know. And uh, it could not be, be possible that a woman wearing full will work as a nurse, no. Plus in the Holy Quran, 
there's a command there, commanding men and women, that you should lower your gaze down when you see a woman, lower your gaze. Mm -hmm. And same order is for men and women. Now, it's very difficult to know if someone is required to cover head to toe. Why, why God, Allah will say, lower gaze. So it is this, this subject will never be solved, it will be controversy, and it will be forever, you know. It's very hard. But Professor Clark, thank you very much for um, spending your time, do some research, and gives us food for thought. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I don't think much. it needs any comment. It's complete in itself. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is um, Faiza Wahid. Uh, I just completed a PhD in cell biology here at the University of Toronto. <laughs> I'm actually here today because uh, Dr. Golden Rosenberg is one of my professors. Um, I took a course with her, and she sent out a lot of emails, and one of them related to this talk here today. Um, thank you, Dr. Clark. That was a very interesting presentation. I have two questions for you. Um, the first one um, is related to what you said. You said that these women who wore the niqab, they came to doing this of their own personal free will. The ones we interviewed, yes. Um, so uh, was there a particular age at which this happened, or was there a common age at, the, at which it happened? Mm -hmm. um, and the second question is, um, from your research, from your on-the-ground research of Canadian women, in uh, Muslim women in, in Canada, um, did you have a sense of whether Islam oppressed women? Um, uh, as as for the as for the first one, as related in the in the report, um, our sample at least showed that uh, women took on this um, this practice as a result. They always said of a meditated decision in their twenties to early thirties. Um, we only asked some women, not all of the sample eighty some, how long they had been wearing the cob. Um, and those fewer numbers, out of those fewer numbers, the number came to 8.5 years, which is quite a long time. But um, we have some sense that it was fair, that it's fairly common, as it is, I think, with hijab, for people to take on the practice and after a while relinquish it. Probably it's more common with niqab because it's, it's more difficult. So um, it looked to me a little bit like a generational thing. And at one point in the report, I talk about possible transference of the practice to the next generation, which we couldn't really tell because I, the next generation hasn't really come up because these women are young. Um, but I say, well, you know, also we have to see if the mode for niqab lasts that long because we don't know if it's something that will grow or if it's permanent or it's a passing thing or, or, or something like that. As for the second um, uh, question, um, patriarchy oppresses women. Um, uh, that I think is, is, is the short answer. And many religions, Islam included, or all religions, um, or some versions of them enshrine patriarchy. That, that would be my perspective. This lady way at the back who. Yeah, I. Uh, well, I have missed out on this listening to your presentation. So I'm wondering if mine could be the last question because it's a slightly general and macro question. So if there are any specific questions related to your presentation, then I would rather that they go first. Okay. Yes. Kevin Moore, I work with the United Church in Regent Park, and we've been uh, particularly working on some interfaith dialogue. Uh -huh. uh, women coming to Canada and deciding to put on the niqab, niqab um, as a religious decision and a religious symbol, my sense for many new Canadians that I meet is that they come here and are quite shocked by how secular Canadian society is. Mm -hmm. And so I suspect that may be part of the reasoning. Um, just wonder if you have any comment. As Canadian society becomes more secular, as people are coming from countries where uh, religious values are, are highly, highly valued. Um, seems to be almost like two sectors pulling in different directions. And is there much? Do you see that as a potential for some for some challenges for us going forward? How to uh, people of faith 
uh, to blend into this increasingly secular society, I guess is the question. Yeah. I'm, I guess I'm not an expert on you know, how secular Canada is becoming or the history of it, but, but I'll speak to this narrow context. Um, the women themselves did not seem to be reacting to Canadian society. Now, we can, um, uh, we can step outside their words and possibly mm -hmm. analyze it that way. I think that that's legitimate. Mm -hmm. But they did not mention that. Um, but they did mention very, very often, um, uh, uh, besides their own religious motivations, which I think were genuine, um, opposition of and apparently to their own natal families. So um, it may be a move mm -hmm. of forming an independent religious identity or mm -hmm. some kind of independence bid in general. That's sometimes how hijab in North America is analyzed because mm -hmm. a young women often take it on against the wishes mm -hmm. of their family. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting in our study, fathers seem to be the great figures who were against niqab and, and some of the some of the women said, well, you know, I, I would have to sneak out of the house and do it, but I wanted to do it. Mm. So it's interesting that it seems to be an independence move more within the community. And um, the way it would relate to the larger community is that, it, that is to the Canadian society, is that um, uh, Canadian society would be the arena where this becomes a challenge, mm -hmm. where, it be, where, where you exercise this choice and show that you are steadfast and, and, and uh, you, know, um, um, you know, meet a challenge, show who you are. Mm -hmm. But I didn't see any talk of, and I wouldn't really think there's a hidden dimension of reaction to secularism. Okay. I just want to add to that, there is a group here in Toronto that we tried to make inroads into and they wouldn't even talk to us, which is completely different from what, what you're hearing today. It is a woman uh, originally from Pakistan who has a doctorate in, in religion from uh, uh, Ireland and her name is Farhat Hashmi and she's, she is, she's got a group in, in here in, in Toronto where she does preach, she is the leader, she does preach women to, to wear the niqab she does preach polygamy. She does. She pre preaches all those things that we may have stereotype in our own minds. Um, they wouldn't talk to us. Mm -hmm. So there is there, there there is this little somewhat close, I suppose, in a way. And she preaches only in Urdu, um, and so it's attracting the the South Asian group, Indo Pakistanis, not Bengalis, yeah. I guess. I don't know how large it is. We don't know, but. Um, one of us could, I guess, put on the niqab and go there, but <laughs> we, ha we haven't done that. That's I mean, I, I do mention this group in here. All I was able to do was access the English language material. I could have turned to anyone and accessed other parts of their site. So all I have is the self-representation and the part of it that is in English. Interestingly, it's a little bit similar to what our women were saying, except as I say in the report, it is rather much more strident and shows a feature that our informants' discourse did not show, that is um, speaking about what I would call men's reasons, that you have to cover up because that keeps bad sexual energy from going around and that way the, the sexes don't to get, get together and attract each other and there's not corruption. So there was some of that on that site, I attached to the Hashimi group, but astonishingly that was not a theme at all among our informants. I, I was amazed at the absence of that because that really seems to be to me to, to be a reason that comes from the formal tradition, especially the conservative tradition, um, which is put out by men. They do not have to seem to have received that whatsoever. They they make up their own reasons, which are what I call women's reasons. I'm comfortable. Um, it brings me closer to God. It's a challenge. Something like that. Ms. Del Sharif, first year PhD student, in CTO. Thank you so much for the study. I thought it was really interesting, or the part that I caught at least. I did get the sense that the population was really um, immigrants. Were they first generation, second generation? I might have missed that because I came in late. 
Um, I didn't get this. Jumpstart. Most most were foreign born, but Canadian citizens, okay. and those and 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 those who um, were born in Canada appeared to be um, first generation. One can guess from different indications. Was, was there a range of ages? Um, as I said before, it's from it's it it is from the twenties to the early thirties. It almost looks like a youth movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kind of a youth fad or something. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much yeah. for coming. Hi, my name is Alicia Spencer. I'm a PhD student in the Faculty of Information here at U of T. <laughs> and uh, my interests are around people who have converted to Islam and the ways in which they pursue knowledge that supports them in that spiritual journey. Um, so, obviously, very interested in what both of you had to say. So, thank you for your presentation. I wanted to ask about the Montreal interview. You mentioned you had one interview from. Montreal. Uh, um, a focus group. A focus Sorry, group. just asking about a focus group that happened in Montreal yeah. as opposed to the mm -hmm. Ontario participants and um, how you identified that person and any differences that you, you noted between the Ontario participants and the one from um, Montreal. Our, our Montreal group, as, as related um, um, in the study, um, was about 10 people, 10, 11 people. You were there for that. I've counted them up, yeah. maybe a little bit more. Um, and um, um, one maybe unfortunate thing about the group was that they were almost without exception Anglophone and East Asian. Now that may be because that is the population that takes on this style, that it may be just that. or there may have been a selection bias. So I sent out my assistants to try to find francophone types who were wearing this style. And they made moderate efforts and did not find any. Um, there were three, uh, three women there who were converts. Yes, there were a few who were yeah. converts too. And, and there, was, there, was, uh, there was one who was an apparent francophone in, in, in addition. Um, as for differences between the two groups, no, I did not find any really any differences. The, um, the types found in the more limited French study are very similar to ours, with a few adjustments for the French for the French context. So there seems to be some kind of dominant or possibly um, dominant type. Um, uh, the one thing about the Quebec group was that uh, even though one of them said they loved Quebec and so forth, they were a little bit apprehensive about um, a possible law that would, uh, about possibly being forced to take off their niqab in Quebec, and they seemed willing to hit the road to come to Toronto, you know, because if, if that happened, so. Not only the niqabis, but I think uh, we're finding out our chapter in Montreal is very active with the Quebec Charter of Values. And I mean, they're, all, they're saying that this affects the hijab as well. It, it affects the yarmulke, the turban, mm -hmm. and, and yes. Muslim yeah. women mostly. And, and they're all saying that they don't know what they'll do. You know, it's this difficult choice, loving Quebec and living there, having their livelihoods there and so on. But whether they will take off the hijab and the niqab, and we don't know yet. Um, well, I think I think that they said very specifically. Then, then I will not do this. I yeah. will have to leave. And a couple of people in other parts of Canada said, "Look, I love Canada, but this is my religion. If if I was ever forced to do that, to take this off, which I will not be, because Canada is what it is." then regretfully I would have to leave. Anyway, with a sample of only 80-some people and 10 in Quebec, one can't draw really any conclusions. The people in Quebec talked more about assault, but that, I think, was because there was one person in particular who had had this series of bad experiences. So I don't want that to characterize Quebec. And just a further question about the demographic. Oh, sorry, I should introduce myself. Uh, Paula Bourne, I'm an associate at the center here. Um, well, you said most of the, the women were in their sort of 20s and 30s. Early um, 30s, yeah. What about, were many of them married or parents? And did that yeah. in any way affect any of their responses? You know, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I, I have a idea, which somebody else might test in further research, that um, some women put on niqab when they get married, it's kind of a part of that transition of a, maybe a formation of a separate <coughs> family from their natal family, um, a sign of a different life or something like that. Um, and the one 
person who spoke to us at length about her decision to take off the niqab and talked about all the hardships and loneliness that she went through was not married. So it could be that you know you take on the niqab as part of that transition, or it's much easier to do it away from your natal family who may have very strong objections and by forming your own family because husbands, although many of them also objected, you know, seem to be more easily convinced than the natal family. I'm sorry I was late. I sort of, I am not used to this weather and I just took longer walk than I can't. Anyway, I'm Poonam Kathulia. I'm from India and I'm an activist who's working on violence against women. Can you speak up so we you can hear you? You have to speak louder. Oh, or come, come into, I think the door is come yeah. into the room. I'm from come India room. and I am a feminist who works on violence against women in India. I just was, I mean, I, I missed out on the presentation, but have got a little bit of a sense of it. And I'm just trying to link back to the Indian context, where mm -hmm. there is something called the Muslim, the feminist Muslim women, movement. Mm -hmm. So there's something, you know, so within the definition of Islam, there is a feminist. And then, uh, so I was wondering if there is that kind of a movement also happening here. You did mention that there is somebody telling women to wear the niqab, but if there's the other way. One of the things that uh, we noticed, uh, in, so in India we have a very strong Muslim feminist movement, which is also trying to, for example, they created their own mosque, and they said, no, we have the, we have the right. This is in South I, India. This is India itself. This is the South, the yeah. Vigita, yeah. Vigita, and yeah. organized. So I'm just wondering if that is a reflection of the overall context of the women's movement within India, which also allows spaces <coughs> like this for Muslim women. For example, you mentioned that in France, for example, women did not object in a similar study to having men present. So what is that context? And what is this Canadian context where Muslim women said, oh, I am uncomfortable having men present. So I'm seeing another analysis uh, from another perspective. And I don't know if it is, uh, somebody said they were, you said they were for spiritual reasons. Uh, Gujarat, I think everyone knows about that. 2002, we had some terrible riots. It was like sort of a program against the Muslim community. And we found that many more women started wearing the burqa after that. So to me, then that is not spiritual. It is a political identity. You know. So you know, so in that sense of the term. So that's my second. And the third is how do we, because you ended on that uh, just now, about how women move to the they get married and start wearing the niqab. Now, the feminist analysis in India, I mean, I come from a community where women do have the veil, so we cover faces. And who covers the face? It's the, ma the woman who comes, the daughter-in-law covers her face, right? And the whole analysis of the othering of the women. So the veil actually becomes, the politics of the veil is that it confines you to the home, it makes you the other because you're coming to this house and now you have to cover your face. And thirdly, it also changes your worldview about the world. I mean, how do you look at the world? The world somewhere becomes the other. So I'm saying, where is this analysis factoring in? And it doesn't need to come from the women. It has to come from you. And I'm just wondering, and would love to hear you. Well, the women are not being confined to the home, so I cannot have that same analysis. Um, um, it's interesting that um, they emphasize their mobility. Um, and um, uh, their meeting of, of a challenge. I mean, if you are pushing me to find limitations in it, the limitation that I would find is, um, uh, you know, why do you feel that, 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 that there has to be this kind of emphasis on the body? But the, the answer to that is, is easy in your, life, in, in your life as a woman. There is emphasis in a body. I mean, you seem to be pushing me to find the limitations that are forcing them to do this. And in the Canadian context, I instead see people who are taking this for our sample who are taking on the practice to transcend some kind of limitations limitations of the natal family limitations 
possibly of the, of, of the larger society, although it doesn't seem to be in reaction to the larger society, um, independent identity formation and so forth. Also, I would resist um, looking only at material factors. I really feel that we should credit um, uh, the words of people who say, you know, I uh, reasonably credit the words of people who say, I do this because the wives of the prophet used to do this and I feel more comfortable doing this and if I take off this niqab, it will affect me psychologically and so forth. I really like to credit my subjects. So um, again, I would emphasize um, the importance of context. If I was looking in an Iranian context, because I've lived in Iran, if I was looking in the context of South Lebanon, because I've lived there, um, I might find that kind of analysis appropriate, but it really does not seem to speak to this situation, or at least to these particular women, because remember that we are not claiming that, because it's unreasonable to claim, that uh, uh, even a very good sample represents every single person. There was one woman uh, who moved here uh, from, from, actually from Pakistan, and she didn't wear it in Pakistan. She, she didn't feel that she would be allowed to wear it in Pakistan. But as soon as she came here, and, um, and a few years later, she put it on. Because she said the freedom in Canada for her yeah. to dress as she so wanted was what allowed her to do it here, where she couldn't have done it in Pakistan or by her family or whoever. Mm -hmm. it, uh, another perspective is that um, um, not just women, but oppressed people in general constantly try to turn what might be in one context mm -hmm. or situation, the symbols of their oppression, mm -hmm. into something else. Yeah, it seems yeah. to me that there is, there is, and I guess it's a commonplace, it's not a, it's not a great and original thought, mm -hmm. that there is always a struggle to, um, 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 to find places to transcend you know, limits that are placed on you, to take what is put on you and turn it into something else, to push forward your own interpretation instead of someone else's interpretation. And here's an interesting possibility. Um, why did these people take on, instead of hijab, the much more challenging and unusual option of niqab? Um, if we credit their own words that it has to do with freedom, maybe it's a way of saying to um, natal families, to male authorities, because um, um, the, the, the imams and so forth in, the, in, this, in this country, as far, as far as I know, are very, very much against this, and community um, authorities in general, to say, look, I'm going to do this even though you don't want me to do this, to sort of push the boundaries. Um, this has actually been noted in some Orthodox Judaic um, contexts. Uh, there are a couple of famous instances of women who insist on covering more and more and doing more religious things to the, uh, um, beyond what their rabbis want them to do, and that's a way of escaping the authority of those, of those people. Um, I mean, that would be a possible analysis, except, again, the women show no signs of having received doctrine or instructions or even really any ideas from religious authorities, and they couldn't name any religious authorities, which, which I found very odd. Mm -hmm. um, just, they could not even cite texts. Um, they just had their own personal reasons and a couple of ideas of what was in the Quran. It seemed to be very much self-created, very unexpected. The one thing, uh, oh sorry, go ahead. My name is Sara Saeed and I'm a psychotherapist as well as a project lead at the Young Work House, which is a shelter for abused women and children in the New York region. Mm -hmm. I really loved your talk and thank you very much for enlightening us all. Uh, I was wondering, like listening to all your responses to uh, the questions that were uh, asked, um, it seems like it's it's something like they've um, the women that were interviewed were either born here or they were like first generation uh, Canadians down here, uh, and sort of like they found that it was freedom for them. Did you find that any of them felt that the, the niqab was 
something that defined them because you mentioned some of them mentioned that if uh, the law states or if they have to start stop mm -hmm. if they can't do the niqab anymore okay. it's unfortunate and they would have to leave Quebec so yeah a couple of them said that yeah so would you say it would be more of like this is what defines me my niqab defines me um. I, I don't entirely seize your question, but l let me try to answer it. First of all, the majority that we came across were foreign-born, although although they would tend to come, it seems, very early to this uh, to this country. So they're very recent um, arrivals. Um, I'm going to take your question as meaning: Is this their identity or a part of their identity? Um, they rarely mentioned identity. Uh, uh, that that was interesting because I expected them to say something about identity, to use that word. They didn't use the word modesty. Um, and one of my assistants said, she, "Well, it must be about modesty." And I said, "You know, they must at least mean that, even if they don't say it." You know. And I said, "Well, maybe I should put that in." And then I said, "No, I can't put the words in their mouth. It's not about that." Um, and it's because of absences like that that I tend to prioritize genuine religious commitment rather than looking at a kind of a materialistic um, uh, analysis. Um, uh, one, in, one informant, and you can read it, did say, well, you know, um, the Jews have this and the Christians have this, and so, you know, shouldn't Muslims also have something, you know, whether it's hijab or niqabs? That seems kind of like an identity statement, but it wasn't... It wasn't everything. And I wouldn't say these people totally defined themselves by, by their dress. Um, that they had plenty of other thoughts besides that. Yeah. Can I just say, um, I should have mentioned earlier on, uh, Professor Linda Clark was also involved some years ago now. I, oh, God, I can't remember how many years ago. We did, the niqab wasn't uh, anywhere around, but the hijab was a huge issue. And so we did a, 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 a lot of research, and uh, she was, she edited, no, you didn't, yeah, you and Sarge, Professor Sarge Alvi. I didn't know. Oh, you didn't edit it, okay. <laughs> uh, Professor Alvi from the University of uh, McGill was. University edited it, but uh, Linda had a, an article in it, and it was a very good book. It was called, the, the, the mm -hmm. people gave it a bad name. It gave Muslim Veil in Canada. No, in North America. In uh, North, North America. America. Canada, uh, we we didn't it. choose the title of the book. But it, it does have some very, very good articles, and it was at that time about the hijab. Yeah. And how, why were young women wearing it? There were, again, a variety of reasons why young women were wearing the, the hijab, and, and all the difficulties they were having with the hijab. Is it about 10 years ago, do you think? No, it was in the 90s. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> Time goes too fast. One, one, but, thing but I, yeah, on one thing I note in the study is that <clears throat> these different themes, um, uh, that, that come out in the interviews are very parallel to what com what comes out or came out in interviews earlier because there's been much more work done on the hijab. So it yeah. seems like there is a hijab movement with a, with a set of themes and motivations and so forth. And then there was on a further frontier almost a niqab, much smaller niqab movement, although I can't call it a movement because it's so small and not networked and so forth. Um, with with somewhat the same themes. I mean, it's it's very it's it's really quite similar. Can I just answer? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we saw almost like a. Can you stand up? Yeah, a, sorry. Um, we we saw sort of a yeah a hijab movement <laughs> after the first Gulf War, mm -hmm. and then after 9/11. So it goes back to what you were saying about you know uh, people wanting to assert who they were. And some of them may have done it by, you know, donning the, the hijab at that time. Uh, and in fact, if you look at campuses today, anywhere in Canada, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's a very the hijab is a very commonplace, you know, head cover. So it's it's interesting, and I don't know who I know. You said there's a lot of research on the hijab. Oh, uh, a lot. <laughs> but but I think um, what I would find very interesting is. Um, now the fact is that there is a preponderance of it, you know, especially in post-secondary uh, education. And what does it really mean? You know, 
we haven't done another uh, hijab study. Yeah, we should. Uh, but I think it's th that study was very interesting, and in fact, some of the things that we found in this study, you know, were kind of reminiscent of what we had heard about the, 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 the difference, though, was that the, with the, some of, many of the young women who were wearing the hijab did have a political and did yes. have an yes. identity. Yes. Yeah. So they, they were there. Yeah. I, th I think I think another difference was that that was somewhat approved by authorities, including male authorities. And I think it's been, um, with respect to the young ladies here wearing hijab, I think that male authority has managed to get in there and do. It's the eternal struggle, and and somewhat co-opt it, some uh, maybe control it a little bit, give it their own meaning. Um, but it's like niqab is a further frontier, and they haven't managed to do that with niqab yet. Um, I, I, possibly there will be a yeah. move to do, so, to do so in the future, but the woman taking on niqab do it very, very much against the wishes of, of family, of community, some, sometimes husbands. It's like a kind of super athletic hijab. It's a hijab on steroids. But we're yeah. going to do, we, you've raised so many good questions that I, I'm hoping that the taping will catch it. You weren't taking notes as well, were you? We should have asked. Um, I think it, it led to a lot more questions, so we obviously have to do more on it. Yes. With that note, uh, I'd like to thank you both very, very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. And, and I, I, I really do, I mean, it seems to me that, uh, as you say, we've laid out an area from some really, really, really For the uh, interesting yeah. discussion. Yeah. Uh, uh, not just research, but discussion, and and I, I think the framing, the the actually listening and speaking to women, mm -hmm. seems so quintessentially feminist, and yeah. really really important, and totally breaking ground, and so does the question of looking at these institutions, <laughs> as you saying all religions and patriarchies and so on, and we've seen, we've seen that kind of uh, juxtaposition or uh, uh, bringing together or approaching of how you do both those things with total respect and not feeding into power is very difficult in a patriarchal and a racist and a class divided society. And thank you for the space that CCMW well, you and for, for us. all that you are creating for that. Well, we're thank delighted you. to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your interaction.